Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Carl Garcia and I'm the campus pastor at our Clear Lake campus. Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we're so glad that you joined us to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe that life is better when we do it together. When we gather as a church, it's a non-downloadable experience. Singing together, praying together, serving together, those are all things that just don't translate online but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you, make plans to check out the campus nearest you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us at clearcreek.org to find out information about our locations, our service times, and so much more. We hope to see you soon. So I have four grandkids. They're all five years old and under, they're basically toddlers. And I've learned that you have to pay close attention when one of them says yesterday. Because to them, yesterday means anything in the past. So they say, hey, we did that yesterday. you got to stop and think. That could be two days, two months, two years ago. For them, it's all yesterday. It's all the same. And then I've heard a new word lately. They've been saying forever. And forever is like, I don't know, anything more about five seconds. But it's not a smart aleck teenager kind of forever. I mean, they're honest. They're like, oh, I'm going to stay at the park forever. You know, maybe a pool forever. Because they have no idea what forever is. Not. It's cute. But it's also the same reason why if they're hungry and you say dinner's in 10 minutes, there's liable to be a nuclear meltdown, right? That's why if you're taking five or 10 minutes to scramble around and pack up to take them someplace fun like the pool, they're having a fit because it's taking forever. So I was curious about this. I looked it up. One doctor said it this way. He said, because toddlers lack a sense of time, they lack a sense of time, they don't have the skills to help control their impulses, express their needs, plan their actions, or cope with stress. In other words, he said, toddlers can't handle it when they don't get what they want right now because when you're a toddler, right now is all there is. Right? Now, I know what some of you are probably thinking. You're thinking, well, I know some grown-ups like that, <laughs> right? Shame on all you wives. <laughs> now, actually, I agree, because I know some adults like that too, right? Pretty much all of us. Because here's what I think. I don't think that much changes as we get older. We still struggle greatly with the concept of time, and we still want everything Right now, don't we? I'll give you a great example of what I mean by that. In my role as a pastor here over the years, I've had the painful privilege, really, the way I look at it, as officiating at many, many, so many funeral services. But every single time I do that, I leave there and I'm driving home and my head is just spinning. I'm like, oh, go home and give Kay a hug and tell her you love her. Then hug her again. Tell you love her again. Hug your kids. Tell your kids you love them. Call your mom. Tell her you love her. Tell Kay you love her again. Hug everybody. Right? Be kind. Be patient. Just appreciate people. Because life is so precious. And people are so precious. And it's all so fleeting. All the way home. Every single time. And then I get home. And I discover that Kay went to the grocery store. But she forgot the vanilla wafers. Yeah. Or she went resale shopping and brought home a coffee mug to add to the 17,000 we already have. And I haven't even changed my clothes. And I'm already back to being frustrated with some trivial thing that's not the way I want it. That service hasn't been over for an hour, and I'm already back to it's all about what I want right now. It's like there's something broken in me. It interferes with my ability to have a healthy sense of time. It's like there's a toddler in me. I can't seem to look back, and I can't seem to look ahead. It's always all about right now. And you get that. And it's this tension, though. It's the frustration and the impatience and the anger that we have over the difference between what I want right now and what's actually happening right now that is the subject of the whole book of Ecclesiastes. And so Ecclesiastes invites us into this to try to understand and appreciate this tension that we have and then choose to live wisely. 
to control our impulses and address our needs and plan our actions and cope with stress right now. Like, like people who really do have faith. So, if you've been keeping up with this series, you know that the, almost the entire book of Ecclesiastes is a record of the observations and teaching of this character, this Kehelet, the preacher is called. And according to the preacher, the world is a confusing place where it's Habel of Habel, all is Habel, right? This Hebrew word that literally means vapor, but it's more translated like stuff happens. Like right now, it's almost never the way it's supposed to be. And even if it is, it's only going to stay that way for a moment because life is random and unfair. There's no formula to make it come out the way we think it should. Bad things happen, and it just doesn't make sense. It's Hebel. And what makes it worse is that we're powerless against so much of what happens. We are not in control. We don't know what's going to happen next. But the point isn't to just complain about that. The point is to teach us to live wisely in the midst of that, even right now. And that's what we've been trying to talk about in this series. But now we come to the very end of the book. And if we're going to understand what we're about to read, we have to remember that there are two voices in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's the voice of the preacher who's been doing all the talking. And now at the end, there's the voice of the author. And he re-enters, and he gives his thoughts about the preacher and all the things that the preachers had to say. Okay, here he goes. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 9. The author says, Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote the words of truth. And so here's the author. He's read and he's thought about all the things the preacher has to say, and he basically gives his endorsement. He says, preacher got it right. He was thoughtful and careful. He wrote the words of truth. It's like, thumbs up. You should pay attention to this. I recommend this for you. But then in the next four verses, in the last four verses, the author gives his personal thoughts about wisdom, about the words of of truth. It's like, here's why... I want you to read what the preachers had to say. Here's the reason we have the whole book of Ecclesiastes. Verse 11. He says, The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so he says, when it comes to dealing with this difference between what I want and what's happening right now, there are three things that we have to think about if we're going to be wise. There is what's true. There's what's untrue. And then there's time. And so the author says that the kind of the aggregate of the things that the preacher said were the words of the wise and the words of truth. He kind of uses those phrases interchangeably. They refer to the same thing, the truth. And his conclusion begins with three points about the truth. He says, the words of the wise are like goads. Now, a goad was just a stick with a sharp point on the end that a sheep herder would use to prod his sheep into going in the direction he wanted them to go. So he says, the truth is like a sheep prod. He says, the words of the wise are like nails firmly fixed. And a nail in his context would have been like a tent stake driven deeply in the ground, so it's going to hold. You can rely on it time and time again. It's secure. The truth is secure. And then he says, the words of the wise are given by one shepherd. The wisdom is rooted in the truth, and all truth comes from one shepherd, and that shepherd, of course, is God. So it's super important to understand that this is the author of Ecclesiastes' premise, that the way God has revealed himself to us is the truth, that what God says about life, what he says about people, what he says about himself is the truth. So square one, God, and everything God says is the truth. Now, I suspect there's some people here thinking, well, I don't know, I'm not so sure about that. 
I mean, I'm, I'm here, but I'm still trying to figure out if I, if I buy that, if I really believe that. And if that's you, all I can say is, listen, that's okay. Because you have to understand, everybody here is doing the same thing. And I say that because you have to appreciate that we don't believe that God is the truth because we say so. Or even because we come to church sometimes. You believe God is the truth by what you do, by how you live. And so our actions, what we choose to do in every moment, how we respond when things aren't the way we want right now, all that points to what we believe. And so for all of us, the big hurdle when it comes to dealing with the difference between what I want and what's happening right now is who gets to decide what's true? Isn't that the, isn't that the question? Now, this is why the preacher throughout the whole book of Ecclesiastes, keeps repeating over and over and over again that God's God and we're not. That's why he gives illustration after illustration after illustration to show that we are powerless, that we're not in control. That's why he says we have something in common with cows and armadillos. That we're just flesh and bone. That our lives are fleeting and we're subject to the chebel of life on earth. So we must trust that God is true. Because he has the power to know what's going to happen next. He's in control, and we're not. So the author just says, preacher's right. There's a one-to-one relationship. To believe the truth is to believe God. To believe God is to believe the truth. Now, the preacher, when he was talking in this book, he's not naive. He's really street smart. Because he knows that we don't and won't just open our hearts and say, okay, that's the truth. And he knows that because he spent his own life resisting the truth. Because honestly, there are many, many situations in our lives when the truth is downright unsatisfying right now. And so he issues a warning, a fatherly warning that's rooted in his personal experience. He says, beware of what is untrue. He says, my son, beware of anything beyond these, the words of the wise, the words of truth. Of making many books, there's no end, and much study is the weariness of the flesh. So beware of anything beyond or other than the truth that God is and that God's God. Now, he warns us about that because he, then, just like today, he knows that there are, there are all, we're all trying to come up with answers to get what we want right now. I mean, every human being struggles with the, the disappointment of life in a broken world. And only, there's, there's only too many of them that are happy to tell us what we should do to overcome. Like there's no shortage of people making books to tell you how you can have it all right now. Right? And we probably know this better than any group of people that's ever existed. Right? I mean, you ever stop and try to quantify, just list out all the, the voices that are trying to speak into your life? I mean, you really should do that. I mean, first of all, if you're a television watcher, there's social values and messages woven through pretty much every TV show. And you got talk radio personalities and all their opinions and podcasters. And of course, you got Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, all the social media stuff. They still make plain old fashioned paper books. Some people are still reading them. Audio books, song lyrics, news feeds, every web page and pop-up ad you see when you say, hey, Siri, what's going on, right? Pretty much everyone is talking, and we're all listening because we all live in the same broken world, and we all want the same things. We all want to be emotionally and materially secure. We all want to be appreciated just as people. We want the respect and the dignity and the justice that we should have just because we're human beings. We all want love, real love. We want physical pleasure, and we want all that stuff right now. So he says, look, the making of many books, there's no end. Just because there's so many people with so many different opinions telling you how to get what you all want. And this kind of interesting, though. If you go through and read the book of Ecclesiastes, then you're going to see that pretty much all the stuff you hear today about how to make your life better right now is really just a modern rehash of the very same things the preacher in the book said he tried. He said, dude, I've done everything. 
I got money. I got physical pleasure. I got power, attention, accomplishment. I got all this stuff. And so listen, he's not knocking anyone. He's just warning. The preacher's warning about what he learned the hard way. That all the context of the many books, all the answers and opinions and influence that flow our ears, they contend with the truth because they're all based on one false belief. And that false belief is that I, that you, that we can be in control. And man, we so want to believe that. We so want it to be true. But it's not. You are in control. That is what he's warning us about because that is untrue. And the preacher in Ecclesiastes says, you know, I used to believe that. I tried it. I chased the wind. I'm wiser today because I've been there done that. Now listen, I, I suspect that probably everyone here is just like me. You have been, you are being influenced to do things, to get what you want right now. And some of those things are things that are, that contend with the truth. And you got to ask yourself, I mean, just watch the news, right? Why do we, why do we listen to the many books? Why do so many of us get talked into overspending, over-medicating, overworking, overeating, and undereating? Why is pornography pervasive in our culture and divorce rampant? Why do so many people rage like toddlers? And I'm just talking about people who say they're Christians. I'm talking about you and me. Isn't it because we allow ourselves to debate the truth? Isn't it because we really just want to believe the lie that we should be able to be in control? And isn't it because we so often live with the toddler's concept of time? We're utterly focused on right now. And so the author just says, look, beware. Beware of all this secular advice for living. Secular just means now. Because all you're going to do is wear yourself out. So you can do a lot. You're just going to churn and churn and churn. And when you get done, you're going to be really tired. And right now, it's still going to be imperfect. So beware of all the secular advice and secular answers. Hold on to the truth. God is God. Because there's what's true. There's what's untrue. And then he says, there's time. Wisdom requires the awareness of time. And there's an urgency you feel in this. Just because we struggle to appreciate time doesn't mean time isn't passing. And what the author says here is that one thing about all the choices that we make, about what we're going to do right now to get what we want right now, he says all those roads lead in time to the same place. Because any and every road we choose is eventually going to lead us to the foot of the throne of God. And God will pronounce his judgment over everything we do, even the secret things we do when no one's looking. And God's going to judge what's evil, and God's going to judge what's good, because he's God. He's the truth. And before that throne of judgment, God's glory overwhelms all of our selfish, feeble explanations for why we reject his commandments to listen to all the secular voices that are more appealing to us right now. He says, in time, all roads lead to the same place. Here are those verses again. It says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So he says, okay, back up. Just for, let's just get everything on the table, right? It's the last word. There's really nothing else to think about. So big picture, Havel of Havel, all this Havel. We live in this broken, dysfunctional world. Nothing's the way it's supposed to be today. We can't control it, and we can't fix it. And I know you know that. Lance found that out last week by your response to his prayer request, Right? A couple weeks ago, I did one of those funerals I was telling you about that I do so often. And this funeral was this sweet couple. It was a service for their baby boy. Yeah, a baby boy. There's another one next week for a man 
it was someone's husband and dad. So I got friends, several friends right now that are battling cancer, and some of them aren't winning. Just because I was in a morbid mood, I looked it up, and I saw 6.3, estimated 6.3 million people have died of COVID around the world, right? And if all that stuff's not bad enough, the New York Yankees are really good this year. It's <laughs> disgusting. There's a question. But can you fix that? I mean, you got some podcaster who's got the answers to all that? Well, of course not, right? We live in a broken and dysfunctional world. It's not the way it should be, and we can't fix it. But what we can do is we can choose how we're going to respond, and we have two choices. We can ignore the truth and ignore the reality of time and trust ourselves to the secular, now-oriented pressures and influences that bombard us all the time. Or we can accept the truth that we're fleeting and fragile creatures. And we can trust that God is sovereign and that God is in control of his creation and his process of redemption, and we can choose to trust him. And the author of Ecclesiastes, it says, when it's all said and done and the dust settles, the only wise thing for any person to do is to fear God and keep his commandments. Now, people get junked up about what that means to fear God. But really, when you boil it all down, it just means to take God seriously. It means to accept the truth that he and he alone is God. To fear God and keep his commandments means that we live in response to the gospel. Like we live our lives in gratitude for who he is and hope for what he's done. So if you think that keeping God's commandments means you've got to have some set of religious rules, you know, that we have to keep, that we're obligated to, like God's commandments are some restrictions on our freedom or some way to limit us from having a good time right now, it just means you don't understand what God wants and what God knows. That he's God. He knows what's best for us. And so to fear God means to obey God because we want to. Listen, I'm, I'm all the time harping at my young grandkids not to slam doors right? because I don't want them to hurt themselves and hurt each other. And of course, they do it all the time. But the other day, I was watching my one-year-old grandson Slammed the door. He had his own fingers wrapped around the end of the door, and he shuts the thing on his own fingers. Right? And then he's standing there, leaning on the door himself. He's mashing his own fingers. And he's so focused on the pain in his fingers, he doesn't realize that he's doing it to himself. And he's just standing there going, ah, ah, ah. I think that's the way some of us live. It's like we've believed the lie of the many books that we can take control and have all we want right now. And we're, we're doing it our way. And we're living like God is opposed to us. And the reality is we're hurting ourselves. One of these days, I think my grandson is going to choose to stop slamming doors. Because... He finally is going to come to understand the danger of it and because he becomes aware of other people so he'll understand why I keep telling him not to do that. But he'll stop because he wants to. And that's the picture. So we fear God and understand that he's the truth, that he's God, that he loves us, that he knows what's good and he knows what's harmful and that he sees far beyond what we see right now far beyond the pain and the struggle that we're in right now, whatever that is. And his truth and this awareness of his time, that has to work together in us. Because that's, it's really the building blocks of wisdom. If you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, you see that the preacher in Ecclesiastes says, wisdom starts with an awareness of time. There's a famous poem in the book that we didn't look at in this series, in chapter 3, but you've probably heard it. It begins like this in Ecclesiastes 3.1. It says, For everything there's a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die. And the poem goes on from there. But he says, Wisdom has its roots 
in the awareness that our life in these physical bodies is a super short span of time. That, that our life here is a microscopic reflection of the unending spiritual life we have in relationship with God. So I say all roads lead to God's throne. And so the author is just saying this combination of the truth that God is God and the awareness of time has power to transform the way we respond when the brokenness of this world invades our lives. We actually can choose to trust God and honor him in the midst of whatever our circumstances are. Even right now, we can be wise. We can control our impulses, express our needs, plan our actions, cope with stress in ways that worship God and actually enable to enjoy our lives right now. But like I said at the beginning, this whole thing about time doesn't come naturally to us. The people think I'm being sarcastic, <clears throat> but I'm not. I kind of tell them, I say, have you ever had a chance to go to a funeral? You should go. And the reason I say that, just because I guess from my experience, going to a funeral is like getting poked in the ribs with a goad, with a sharp stick. If you're at a funeral and you're paying any attention, it's pretty hard to escape the reality of time. And I typically do that because it's good because we need continual prodding because we live in the continual difference between what we want and what's happening right now. And the continual prodding just helps remind us that wisdom is not a one-time decision. Wisdom is an all-day, every-day, right-now choice in the midst of real life. The stuff's happening. You know, big stuff, like you get really sick. Little stuff, like somebody posts a lie about you on Facebook. Like if you need money that you don't have, or if you just have this craving for pleasure, or craving for a relief from stress. And so I don't think it's an accident that the first thing the author of Ecclesiastes said about truth is that the words of the wise are like goads. I just think it's a great picture that we need someone poking you in the ribs with a sharp stick because we need it, but it hurts. The truth does hurt, doesn't it? I mean, it hurts our pride because we so badly want to believe we're in charge of the universe. And it's true that we so resent, resist being limited. It's insulting that God would interfere with us doing what we want to do to get what we want. It also hurts us because I think deep down inside we, have a, we all have this kind of this sense of guilt that we all know we're guilty of ignoring God's commandments to go about getting what we want right now. That's why we keep secrets. That's why when we get confronted, we blame other people for what we're doing. The truth jabs us in the ribs. Now I don't know about you get jabbed over. Maybe you're like me, and sometimes you're just a whiny little punk. <laughs> Maybe you've gone astray, I don't know, over how much you love money or what you do for pleasure or how you treat people who are less powerful than you are. I don't know. But I do know that we're all in the same boat, that we all ignore God's commands. We're all getting jabbed all the time. There's another writer of wisdom in the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah. He kind of summed it up like this in Isaiah 53. He said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. It's like we all have this in common. We've all bought into the many books that we have when we do reject God and we take our own road to get whatever it is we want right now. And right now, God is goading us with the truth because he's God, that we're not in control and time is fleeting. But here's what you got to hear. God isn't goading you in the ribs to move you to the foot of his judgment throne like a sheep is goaded to a slaughter pen. I mean, that's not why we're here. The rest of that verse in Isaiah says this. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It says, someone else has gone before us to the slaughter. Someone took our place before the judgment throne of God. This is the message of the gospel of Jesus. We've all gone astray, and the Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of our sin. Isaiah says in the next verse, 
It says Jesus was oppressed. And he was afflicted. Did he open not his mouth? Like a lamb that is led to slaughter. And like a sheep that is that before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. You think about if there was ever a person who knew the hebel of life on earth, who experienced what it was like to be disrespected and betrayed and humiliated, who knew poverty and suffering. If ever there was that person, it was Jesus. And the greatest of all hebel, the most irrational, unfair thing that's ever happened to anyone was, was when Jesus went like a sheep to the slaughter. In our place. And Isaiah says he didn't even open his mouth. He did it willingly because he knew that we have no other hope. Because we all have and do put ourselves on God's throne and make up our own commandments based on whatever it is we want right now. And so if Jesus' death on the cross is the most unfair, unrational thing that ever happened, The second most unfair, irrational thing that ever happened is that his death atones for our sin. For mine and for yours too. And it opens the door to eternal life. It opens the door to all time in relationship with God. It gives us grace. And when we receive that grace, if we would just Stop long enough to think about what's true and what's not true. To think about time. To think about who Jesus is and what he's done and embrace his gospel. We can begin to live with a new perspective. We can appreciate time. We can grow up in our ability to really discern what is untrue and why it's untrue. And we can be transformed inside so we actually have a desire to live out what is true. We can do before God what we wish our toddlers would do with us. We can fear God because we know he loves us. And we can keep his commands because we want to thank him, worship him, live for him. We can live wisely right now. But it requires that we think deeply and carefully because there's what's true there's what's untrue and there's time would you pray with me Father even as I study and think about this closing of the book of Ecclesiastes I just see I hear you speaking to me I see myself all over the place in here. That I can be so secular, so selfish, so pathetically focused on what I want right now. And when I do that, I know nothing good ever comes. And it brings me comfort, Father, to know somehow that we're all in the same boat. And it's just the amalgamation of all of our selfishness and sinfulness that that contribute to the brokenness of this world and the brokenness that we experience in our own lives, not notwithstanding all the things that happen that we have no no part of. So my prayer is that we would spend enough time thinking about all this stuff to realize that we're not you. That only you are you. And that we would trust you. And as we trust you and we see the difference between your glory and your holiness and our sinfulness and selfishness, that we would begin to appreciate what you did at the cross for us. How you made a way, how you paid for our sin, how you have given us back eternity and hope. And so, Lord, help us trust you. Teach us to to appreciate what's true and what's untrue. And I pray, Lord, give us awareness that time is fleeting. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.